Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Royal Drawing School's Creative Conversations series uh, curated by Dr. Claudia Tobin. My name's Harry Parker. Uh, I'm Director of Education for the Royal Drawing School. It's a real uh, pleasure to welcome Tunji Adam jones and Alayu Akin-Kube tonight. Uh, I think if you both, uh, if you both un unmute, that would be great. Hi, sorry. Hi, Tunji. Um, it's great to have you. Thanks, thanks, for, jo thanks for joining us. Um, so Tunji was, I'm just going to run through your, your uh, bios, both of you, and then, and then I'll hand over to you. Uh, Tunji was educated in, in the UK and he now lives and works in, the, in, in New York. He, growing up, he spent a lot of time between London and Lagos, and in 2014 he received his BA from the Ruskin School of Arts, Oxford University, and then an MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale School of Art. His practice is inspired by the ancient history and mythology of West Africa and by his Yoruba heritage. His paintings emerge from a perspective of what he describes as cultural addition, combination and collaboration. This year, his first solo museum exhibition, Astral Reflections, was held at Charleston, East Sussex in the UK. And in 2021, he had a solo exhibition of that which binds us at the White Cube Berlin Sea. And he's also exhibited around the world. Alayo uh, graduated from University of Cambridge with a BA in History of Art in 2001 and is currently undertaking an MA in Curating at the Courthold. She's the founder of the Instagram platform, A Black History of Art, which highlights black artists, sitters, curators, and thinkers from art history and the present day. Her aim is to continually champion emerging and forgotten black artists from across the globe and across all periods of art history in a bid to change the way art is taught and presented in the West in favor of a more global and inclusive approach. Thank you both for joining us. Just a quick note for everyone at home, do, do chat questions in the chat, and there's also a, there's also a question option. Um, Tunji and Elayu are gonna uh, speak for about 45, 50 minutes. We've got some images of Tunji's work, and then we'll, we'll, we'll cut some questions at the end. So yeah, do throw the questions, anything at all, and we'll, we'll get them to, 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 to the speakers at the end. Thank you both. I'm gonna hand over to you now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Harry. Thanks very much, Harry. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's a uh, honor and a privilege. You know, I'm, I'm from London, um, born and raised, and the Royal Drawing School is um, an institution I've been aware of and excited about for quite some time. You know, maybe 10, 12 years, I have some close friends that have passed through um, that school. So yeah. I feel I feel strongly about the program. It's good to be speaking with you guys and to have Alayo here as well. Thank um, you so much for inviting me to um, have this conversation with you, Tunji. Um, and yeah, I feel really honored to be here. Um, shall we start with yeah. um, the most obvious question, um, which is where does drawing and sketching come into your practice, if at all? And I noticed that um, at the start of the pandemic, you were working kind of on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you did prints before that or not, but where does drawing kind of feed into this? Yeah, so uh, a great a great place to start. Thank you for that question. And um, so yeah, with this first image even, this is um, a monotype print. And uh, yeah, it's also framed behind me in the background. It's one of my favorite images um, and it kind of, symbolizes where I began this investigation of the West African, specifically Nigerian iconography, like imagery within my work and using sort of drawing to do so. I was really allured by the traditional scarification and sort of mark making that, you know, very kind of physical mark making that was um, displayed both in sculpture and in, in real life um, on sort of like either the face or, or the chest or just, um, yeah tribal signifiers and it seemed to me from a drawing perspective an incredibly rich um, and resourceful place to start representing the body I've been working with the body before long before um, you know I studied um, anatomy and we went into the morgue and, and we're drawing sort of dead people and sort of you know decapitated mm -hmm. bodies and all these things and bringing in the full anatomy in all its different elements and parts and ways and understanding what um, composes the body was what I was digging into for a while but then once I finished that program I was left feeling perhaps a bit directionless I had a lot of tools but I didn't quite know how to use them or where I wanted to to push them so 
once I found this fruitful ground of sort of my own history and then a more expansive West African history, Black history, just across the world throughout all different kinds of art and music and, and form, it, it became clear that I could start um, playing around with this imagery and thinking about traditional um, West African sculptures, the um, Benin Kingdom heads, so the, yeah. like this image here. So I was going to say, just... this, this very much reminds me of the Benin, um, an Ife bronze head that's in the British Museum. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so that's um, basically it. That's, that's how this whole body of work that includes the Charleston show and the White Cube show, that's how it all kind of started me just playing around with real artifacts. objects. Yeah, artifacts, yeah. And so for you, again, and part of the point was, I would feel like in doing so, I was able to communicate on multiple levels to an audience that would either recognize um, the quite specific historical origin and also might just recognize that there's something else there. So like, yeah. Yeah, like how do you feel about also that that, that way that it's communicating um, beyond my sort of intention? I mean, when I look at this, um, I see, I sort of get the impression that I'm looking at, yeah, an artifact or, I mean, I look at it and I immediately, like I said, I get the image of the Ife bronze head. And that mm -hmm. speaks to me as a, with my own specific interest in Nigerian history and Nigerian culture, also being Yoruba like you. Mm -hmm. um so I guess that that's what it communicates to me but I think it would be interesting for someone who's not kind of familiar with this um icon, icon iconography um I'd be intrigued to hear what people think mm -hmm. um and thinking about some of your other works and um just kind of your your oeuvre as a whole your mm -hmm. paintings your prints everything is very kind of dynamic um, and your figures in many cases appear to be dancing, um, like this one here. Um, mm. And you've spoken in, in other discussions about your interest in dance as a language that cuts through language, through verbal language, mm. um, and um, religious or cultural barriers. And mm. um, I guess dance is something that's very significant in the Nigerian context, um, mm -hmm. given the multitude of languages and ethnic groups. Um, mm. and the way dance kind of, yeah, is a form of communication that mm. defines all of those barriers. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I, I want to ask about how you draw inspiration from traditional dance and rituals for your comp compositions. Yeah, it's, it feels like, um, it feels like a, an endless kind of pool that I can kind of dip in and out of um, when I, when I travel, when I move, when I experience new places. So, that, that kind of mini thesis about the, the dance communication um, beyond language, like verbal language, physical language came after um, I took a really formative and frankly life-changing trip to Senegal a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it became clear that, you know, I was very familiar with Nigeria as you and I know it and sort of like my relationship to West Africa through, West Africa through there. Now mm -hmm. I was also in the same part of the world in an entirely unique um, example of a place that I have no ties to. And yeah. there were things that I, there was exactly there were ways that I found I could enter and there were ways that I found I was also sort of observing and learning. Yeah. And regardless of all of the above, it did seem like physical movement and gesture was a really unifying thing. And that was a really quick way for me to involve myself and my body and, and sort of see how other people were moving from a grassroots level to the top. You know, like, I mean, Senegal, Dakar just also happens to be just like Nigeria, a very dance heavy nation. So yeah. everyone is just dancing and, and the children from really young to like as old as you can get, everyone is just moving and it's a very kind of community-based system and, of expression. And dance is so kind of central to every sort of major life event, I feel like in Nigeria, whether it's a funeral or a birthday, mm -hmm. um, a christening, a kind of, I don't know, it's this omnipresent thing. Um, I mean, well, not just in Nigeria, I think probably across most of West Africa. Well, um, I'm, so I'm glad you said that, yeah. Yeah, and um, that leads me to think also about music, especially traditional music and Yoruba kind of juju music and um, the talking drum as well. I think when I look at some of your larger paintings where there's lots of figures and lots of colors, I get that almost kind of, yeah, sonic effect and I kind of hear like the rhythm so I mm. wonder where music comes into your practice and if you're trying to evoke sound and um yeah music in your in your work yeah absolutely so there's there's a sonic element 
I would really hope that the, the work communicates. So I'm glad, I'm glad that's being picked up on to an extent. Um, I think, I think sequencing and repetition is a big part of that for me. So even throughout this presentation, you'll see maybe similar kinds of compositions, or perhaps it's the same body moving again and again in the same kind of routine or movement and getting used to seeing the same thing or perhaps a slight abbreviation or alteration of, of, of a movement, a person, a form, a gesture over a large span as kind of like an experience is, um, is what I'm really interested in, in creating. And I'm not sure, perhaps, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the wedding sort of ceremony or funeral thing, because that's been a part of my life throughout the whole, throughout my whole life. Yeah. Going to Nigeria, going anywhere really, and having a five day plus six day plus ceremony that includes yeah. all these things. And it's a lot of repetition. It's a lot of, you know, routine. It's a lot of ritual. It's a lot of practice. It's a lot of dance. It's a lot of movement. And ultimately it's expression and communication, right? Um, and yeah. that's what I want the work to do too. So if you've seen some of it, you'll maybe recognize some distinctive stylized, stylizations repeated, that are mine. Yeah. But yeah. you also see some repeated themes because that's also what I'm interested in, you know, perhaps just so that it gets the person thinking, whoever's looking at it, oh, is this the same thing I saw before? Is this a different routine? Is it kind of like part of a larger movement? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's speaking to kind of a broader orchestrated kind of. So would routine you say that sort of all of your works kind of speak to each other as well? There's kind of a correspondence between them. Um, yeah, beautifully put. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And um, this is an excellent image. Um, I was going to ask you now about um, curves. So this is a great um, mm -hmm. one to be looking at and curvilinear forms. And um, you've already talked about how um, you're influenced by traditional sculpture, which often tends to be very rounded and curved. I'm thinking about those kind of like carved wood sculptures that are everywhere in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and also about Ben and Wamu, who you cited mm -hmm. as an extensive guide and influence. Um, mm -hmm. And your works were shown alongside his at Charleston last year, mm -hmm. and maybe even into this year. Um, mm -hmm. So could you talk about his influence um, on your style? I love the correspondence between your kind of sinuous figures and those in his negritude mm -hmm. paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and those are really, to me at least, icons of Nigerian modern art, and I feel like they were kind of everywhere growing up, growing up um, in domestic contexts and otherwise. So yeah, could you just kind of expand on Mwamu and the curves and negritude? Yeah, absolutely. So it was a bit like when I mentioned before, when I finished my undergraduate studies, sort of heavy academic drawing, rendering kind of draftsmanship and specifically figurative anatomy drawing, I didn't quite know what to do with it. So it took some years for me to kind of come to Ben and Mwamu's work and see that there was an access point there for me to start learning from because I was just typically looking at a very sort of uh, sound white art history of, of drawing and, and painting mm -hmm. and I was really looking at like Freud and Bacon and, and yeah. you know Jenny Savile like very specific kind of figurative representation and yeah. then it became clear that I could sort of look back sort of in my own kind of upbringing and find like you said these images that have been around all the time that I haven't been looking at in that way and so now I find that I'm already mm -hmm. surrounded by all of these things so um and one who absolutely has been instrumental the work his work um and also sort of the work of, of his, his son Oliver who's who's still painting now has been instructive mm -hmm. for me um and okay perfect yeah William Blake another one who I before really coming to and one who's work was looking to for like dramatic poses like this pose I think is so dramatic yeah. like the way the form is twisting and everything that's a big part of the work too I think that the body can be a really wonderful instrument of sort of storytelling now Blake was also a poet so there's like a lot of poetry at the top and all that so mm -hmm. I usually with my work will, will kind of refrain from the text but I think I love the drama and I love how the body can be so um uh evocative and suggestive and and captivating without having to do much else other than just show the contortion of a twisting back in a kind of like, you know, deltoid trap, like thigh or something yeah. twisting. That's that's what I'm really interested in. So, and Monwu's work has that too. And it's clear that his education both in Nigeria and in the UK on an art and otherwise sort of global level helps bring those two things together. Sort of the traditional West African performative um, dance and then also, um, an exposure to 
European history coming together mm -hmm. to kind of make these really, really um, evocative and, and stunning images. So yeah, and one was work has been um, instrumental and just kind of like, in terms of me helping to navigate where I want to go, it's been wonderful to see such a broad catalog of his work and see such an expansive means of representation and expression. Um, and, and his work is full of curves as well. I think the, that, well, okay. <laughs> Bob, Bob yeah, Thompson. I was is, actually is just about to come on to Bob Thompson. So yeah. this is also really yeah. good because, um, yeah. yeah, um, there's that sense of compression and flatness in your works and mm -hmm. Bob Thompson also has this kind of thing going on. And, um, also, um, he synthesizes culture and cuts across time and, Kind of includes figures like Nina Simone, but then also Renaissance mm. and Baroque, like mythological figures. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you, I, I, I'm getting the impression that you're very interested in this idea of synthesizing cultures. Um, mm. And yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and maybe you could talk a bit about the flatness as well. So yeah, thanks for bringing up flatness. That's really important. And Bob Thompson's work, sort of, as soon as I moved to America um, in 2015 gave me license to start being a bit more abstract with the way I render the body, both in paintings, drawings, prints, or anything. So the Red Twins painting from just a few slides before, for example, came as a direct response to paintings like these, where I was like, oh, cool, you can paint bodies just yellow or just red, and that's yeah. fine. You know, coming from a very specific, as I mentioned before, idea of having to articulate a human body in a very Euro traditional some sort of way that was descriptive. And Aaron Douglas too, um, I sort of discovered these two artists at the same time during my master's program um, at Yale. It really informed a way that I can start expressing black bodies, um, whether they be black American, whether they be black African, whether they be sort of black South American, just mm. black bodies in a way that was like really, really um, powerful and stoic and also yeah. through the silhouette, right? So that flatness being the silhouette and how that actually through reduction of a feature becomes incredibly additive. So it means that everyone yeah. can kind of come to this image that is in theory quite stripped black, um, <laughs> stripped back and mute. Yeah. Um, but you can then like access it from multiple angles and spaces. So that's where I also got into this idea of the silhouette and kind of rendering yeah. bodies. Um, but not just simply representing the black body as you see it, but stripping yeah. it back to kind yeah. of the essentials that let you know that it's still a black body, like in one move. Yeah. And that's an interesting parallel between the two that I found throughout this kind of um, this project mm. that's been sort of Aaron Douglas working in the Harlem Renaissance and then one we're working within the negative movement between West Africa and Europe, yeah. both operating the same way of using the black silhouette in this mm. kind of evocative and almost like form of protest of representation being yeah. like, we're going to really strip it back and we're going to allow it to be as expressive and accessible as possible and yeah. as bold as possible and that's as you mentioned before yeah that's that's for me is just like the biggest has been the biggest green light and um form of encouragement yeah yeah and um another thing that i wanted to talk about which i think and one does kind of reference myth a little bit um and bob thompson more so but um mm. You said, um, I hope that this is actually a quote that you said, but I found it online and um, it said, um, every memorable Greek myth or fable that we know has an equally compelling African counterpart. Um, so I think it would be interesting to hear about um, mythology and literature mm -hmm. and the importance mm -hmm. of literary figures in your work. Um, and also I think you've talked about the importance of Chinu Achebe and Wale Shoenka. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, could you talk a bit about myth and um, the extent to which you kind of draw on a canon, as it were, of African of African literature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that so that was a quote. I was very happy with myself when I <laughs> when I came up with that one. That was um, after I read Flash of the Spirit by Robert Barris Thompson um, mm -hmm. a few years ago, and he very very generously started creating all these equivalencies between kind of Greek mythology and specifically sort of Yoruba history and Yoruba deities and Orisha and the very specific mm -hmm. gods and characters and how they were moving in the same way that I was exposed to reading about Athena and all of these things when I was doing classical civilization. So that that instant kind of one-to-one, -one, I didn't 
I wasn't exposed to before and it was quite eye-opening for me and I mean that's present here even in in, in the cinema piece where you see the traditional sculpture and the body behind and then the drummer and a sort of implied narrative just through the symbology yeah so the mythology um that I'm bringing to it has been shifting. I think at the very beginning, it was very Yoruba specific. And then as I've been moving around more and traveling more, I've been open, to, I've been trying to open that up and make it more expansive because um, ultimately I'm learning about, I'm learning as much about this content as sort of the viewers are of my work because mm -hmm. it's still, it's very much an investigation and I'm very much a student of this history too, even though I have sort of ownership of it. Um, and I want that to be clear in the work. It's a very, um, open-ended narrative that's uh yeah it's very accessible I want it to be as accessible as possible and mm -hmm. um as illuminating as possible and I want it to also be understood that this is a search and this is a journey um and yeah works like this um by Mommu like incredibly dynamic and the colors are just yeah the high con contrast yellow blue yeah. and the figure holding the the frame in this way um that's touching all corners for me it's just yeah incredibly electric and and, and seductive just as a composition yeah. as an image. I mean yeah what really just struck me about what you said is um the figure kind of holding the frame so I noticed that in mm -hmm. paintings it's often that kind of I don't want to say constricted because there is still that sense of fluidity and free movement but um mm -hmm. they kind of contort to fit the the canvas um mm -hmm. Could you kind of speak about that? So it's, I think it's, I I used to see it as perhaps a bit of a problem, the constrictedness, mm -hmm. the, the the binding of the characters yeah. within the frame. And then, yeah, as we look through these in one movie works, we see that it's very similar. I think it's also, it's a good way to add tension um, yeah. and, and build a kind of force within the pictorial frame. And I think it's also um, a really, pure expression of, of human condition and and if i'm being honest do i often feel very tense and bound by energy mm. given my social context often yes whether i am anywhere i am frankly you know yeah. if i'm in lagos where one of the most densely populated nations on the continent you yeah. know you feel it still got you that feel... sense of constriction despite all the sense it's, of and freedom and, and movement yeah. Yeah, it might be it might be the constriction of a warm hug from family, you know, yeah. but it is still it's still there's people you it's feel energy. Mm. Yeah, there's tightness and it's kind of like um, it's you are always rubbing up against something and someone and mm. it's quite, you know, it's inspiring. It's invigorating. It's all yeah. of those things, too. But I think in a pictorial sense, that is very true of this imagery. And that's also something that I try and put into my work because it's how I feel. I feel a lot of forces that I'm both giving out and receiving as I move mm. around the world or anywhere. And it's an interesting way to represent that, I think, sort of presenting these bodies where you see an elbow kind of like touching the very top of the frame or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I really felt that kind of tension between yeah, liberty and constriction when I was looking at your paintings. Mm. Yeah, um, that's nice. yeah. And um, I want to ask a bit more about um, your process um, and drawing and painting and color and all of that kind of thing. Um, and uh, one thing that struck me as I was kind of doing more research into your work was um, the fact that you do reference a lot of um, like Nigerian history and cultural history, but mm. looking further back than in Wamu and the 20th century, um, there isn't really painting in our history. So how do you kind of approach painting as this kind of very Western tradition, it, it's kind of like a Western art form, shall we say, uh, or uh, what didn't really exist in Nigeria pre-colonial um, yeah. pre times. Um, how do you yeah. kind of navigate using this medium to um, represent the more kind of traditional things? Um, yeah, it's I mean, great point. It's, it's essentially how I justify it to myself um, as being something really worth pursuing and adding to given that in in our history and in the nation it's it's quite recent in the sort of oil paint on canvas sense right and so i mm -hmm. see it i see the potential of of it being quite quite additive to that yeah. and i think you know my history and education 
in, in London and to an extent in America too has just been so Euro Western centric in, in terms of the art that I've been looking at. And just more wow. recently, I've come into and one with Bruce on Obra Pea, um, mm. Demas and Moko, like Yusuf Grillo, all artists who I think, you know, I would recommend that every sort of role drawing school student looked at, you know, and sort of like held up on the same level as every other kind of artists we study in these programs and, and in these curriculums. Um, just on a, above everything, like a, a formal level and on a chromatic level for color schemes and compositions. And yeah, I've, I've found a lot of joy in, in looking back at very early 20th century Nigerian artists, because just as you said, they were asking themselves the same questions. Like Bruce yeah. Anabrapea was asking himself the same question. Like, so what am I supposed to do with this medium? that's not ours in, a, in that sense, yeah. but it is yeah. It is the expression, the color, everything else is expression, color, form, dynamism. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's even more so you could argue, you know, it's even more, it's even more kind of uh, natural and, and organic and around you than it would be anywhere else, you know, yeah. than if you were sitting in, in Marseille or something, which is why the French yeah. modernists went to West African, like all these West African objects and images and had their minds blown because of, yeah. The sort of direct connection to something that as creators we are all kind of looking for so it's it's interesting i think to to come back to that question I, it just gives me um a direct uh sort of in uh inspiration and, and kind of permission to just keep going with the painting thing yeah so that so that we can start really growing that developing our own it. language yeah. rather than just yeah. one with the modernists yeah That's yeah yeah, adding um, to it, building, and and yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, in terms of color, um, oh yeah, I I really wanted to ask about blue, um, mm. and that kind of indigo, the deep indigo that recurs in all of your works, which I find to be a very kind of emotional and moving, melancholic color, which you see a lot in Nigeria. I know probably. Generally, we would associate Nigeria more with kind of vivid, vibrant, vibrant colors that you see at like mm. weddings and things. But in the, and things, but in the everyday, um, there's Adira fabric, which your mm. work kind of makes me think about, and um, which is this blue and white uh, fabric. Um, and yeah, I think the first thing I picture um, when I think of your work is kind of that deep blue palette. So um, yeah, what does this color? What is this color meant to evoke in your work? And um, what is the importance of blue and indigo? And yeah, path? yeah. Thank you um, for the. For, so you've kind of, with the way that you set up the question, that's helped me think about an answer because I struggle with this question to kind of yeah. give it as an expansive as as an answer. Whereas you know, if, if I'm talking about maybe line or drawing or something else, but when it just comes to the blue, I'm not yeah. sure. I just I'm I'm using it in this way that um, I think is um also a long-term thing where i i see it as a challenge for myself i think that i'm still working through on a technical level how to use the most of it and understand the different types of blue the different pigments that you know I'm, as you mentioned i'm familiar with the more west african adira kind of print appropriation that then is also European and Southeast Asian as well of the, that kind of blue, which I grew up around. But then in a painterly sense as well, there's, there's, a, there's a rich history there too. And I'm really just a student of it. I really don't, I'm just trying to, trying to understand it through, mm. through constantly using it. And I think it, it evokes this real, um, you know, it can be a deep, a deep mood that's either it can be a bit down, you know, it can, it can be a bit heavy, but I, I also yeah. find it to be quite um, stimulating and enriching. Invigorating, and so, yeah. And in invigorating. Way. So, for example, these two characters here that are kind of dancing or, you know, jostling through this space, I just think it gives it such um, a kind of charm, those blue tints. And it's a very, it's a very agreeable color, you know, in a color theory sense. Um, you can yeah. really work around it um, and use different things to, to bolster it or to kind of mute it a bit. Um, again, things that I'm learning. So it's it's just provided that palette specifically, the deep blue, the indigo, has provided a kind of rich ground for my development, I think, as an artist, a painter, a draftsman. Um, because I'm always trying to learn and, and it, it's really kind of provided me with a lot, a lot to work with. Yeah. 
fantastic. Yeah. Um, and scale as well, I think is important to talk about in relation to the ones that are being shown now on the screen, because mm. are these the these are the smaller ones that you made yes. at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, right? Yes, exactly. Um, what was it like? I, I saw in an interview you mentioned it kind of a smaller scale allowing you to experiment more. Um, mm. Can you talk about experimentation and um, yeah, having to scale down during the pandemic? Yeah, so this is a good example of that. If we look at kind of uh, facing the screen, the top left, where there's more of just an abstract color mixture space where mm. I was using watercolor and, watercolor and ink and just letting it do its thing. Um, working on the small scale kind of has, has given me more license to just let the medium um, flow and, and be a bit less controlled with absolutely every aspect of, of, the, of the picture frame and the composition. And I'm trying to work to a point where I can get the large canvases to be that free in certain areas as well. I kind of give myself very tight restrictions to to how I'm rendering sort of subject, object, foreground, background. But on the small scale, especially because it was pandemic and I was moving around trying to travel internationally to do various things, to work, to see family. And I found myself in moments where I could kind of just sit and draw, whether mm -hmm. I was in, uh, you know, hotel room quarantining in a, in a foreign country or something um it definitely yeah it it kind of took the pressure off and then I was able to find that I was more trusting in like we just mentioned before the color and allowing the color to just like the blue to kind of pull and do more things yeah and yeah this is another example of that where I kind of am just trying to let go of it actually and the pandemic and was, the color kind of lends that. itself to that yeah. a lot more doesn't it and your your larger paintings are oil or acrylic they're oil yeah 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 which is kind of almost like the opposite of watercolor in my head um oh no you're you're right yeah, control you're right. and like um yeah i guess watercolor was a good medium to experiment in yeah no well, well said you, you've understood it completely i mean you can use oil like watercolor too i'm not that competent with the medium yet but generally speaking oil is more forgiving and if you feel that it's not going your way, you can just paint over it again. You can't really do that with watercolor. It's kind of just the drop is the drop. And so you, yeah. it requires a different level of release and a different level of, of confidence. And so with drawing, for example, yeah, for me, I'm very tight with my line. And so this then becomes about allowing for a more natural line that a pool of color will rub up against another pool of color and create a line that I haven't drawn. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, I've just, you know, I've been having to allow new lines to and form. surrender to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And something else that I wanted to ask, which kind of diverts away from everything that we've been talking about um, mm. in terms of Nigeria and focusing on West Africa and dance and all of that kind of thing is mm. your Western influences because you grew up in the UK. Um, mm. I guess seeing lots of European art at school and in museums mm -hmm. and like that. And you've mentioned pop art as um, an influence um, and that when you were younger, you kind of used to do graphic novels and things like that. Mm. Um, and your work has been likened to Matisse cutouts, which mm. might be a bit far fetched or I don't know. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yes, please. Um, it's the, the Matisse conversation is never one that I bring up, but it's <laughs> always there. It's quite funny. I, I, I think it's it's. I can see it when um, the examples are shown to me, but I would hope that at least as you've heard our conversation now, as not as I'm speaking to you, but as I'm speaking to our audience, you can kind of sense that what I'm pulling from is just a bit more broad and, and deep than that. And the Matisse reference ends up being quite flat in a more like uh, um, uninformed sense where if you look yeah. a bit deeper, you'll see that there's plenty there. And yeah, it's interesting because in my, sort of Ruskin education and then when I moved to the States I wasn't really looking at Matisse either I, I, it was more um it was more you know I a feely doig also mm. played it played a really formative role and in, in, in sort of my sense of composition and and my sense of feeling like how I as Nigerian British traveling around could conceive of a career and and feel like there was a a pathway, right? Because yeah. maybe I only had Yenka Shonibari as an example, maybe when I started the Ruskin in 2010 mm. or something. And now 
it's great because you're hearing about your Denzel Foresters and your Frank Bowlings and yeah. you know it's really really fantastic for that I needed that about a decade ago I really yeah. did I feel um, you know exactly the same yeah, as in yeah. growing up and then yeah. not having any of those influences in art history and then all of a yeah. sudden we're finally getting yeah. someone um, yeah so which yeah. is which is fantastic and, and with the work you're doing as well um, which is why it's great that we can speak like this that you also having a will have a large part to play in how that continues to change and and, and manifest yeah. because it has been a big change over the past decade and yeah it's exciting to feel like okay you know everyone can now start learning from these incredible sort of black british black european artists too um yeah. that, that have been around since the 80s 90s doing incredible stuff so um yeah, it's it's been a lot of uncovering and, and looking back and kind of, I won't say unlearning, but but putting a few things to the side and, and focusing on on some some other things too. Yeah. Um, it's in a, in a historical sense, um, in terms of the the syllabus I was I was exposed to and and the kind of independent study I then had to to do. Yeah. On my own. Yeah. And I guess perhaps not every black student art student these days is going to have to take that very independent path of trudging through art history books to kind of find some influences or something that resonates with perhaps perhaps resonates with them a bit more than Matisse. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, the, the ideal scenario is that that uh, that that is just a part of the syllabus anyway, so that everyone is exposed to it and that yeah. whether you go through a semester or term and you're looking at a selection of artists that, that everyone who is there should be there next to each other that yeah. you're looking at Frank Bowling and Bacon at the same time because they were around at the same time and they knew yeah. each other, you know, and, and, and Frank Bowling made paintings in response to Francis Bacon, you know, that's, that should be a way that people learn about, like that's just should be a way that everyone learns about British art history, you know, mm. that, and, and it's, and it's essentially, you know, becoming that um, we're all championing artists like Frank right now as it should be. So we can just hope it continues and that everyone um, is exposed to everything. You know, that's the that's the idea, really. Yeah. Yeah, and that's these last cool. few ones that we're looking at, I um happen to. These are some of my favorites, I think. Oh, okay. Um, well, I was. I do have a couple of other questions. One. Yeah, please. Was about the fact that your figures are not a specific gender. Um, yeah. could you talk about that a bit? I know you said that, like, um, often. Um, yeah, people might think because of the palette that you've used that oh, this is a female figure and this is a male figure or the way the figures relate to each other, they might make, make assumptions about their gender. But um, mm. but there isn't like a clear, you're not trying to ascribe any gender onto the figures, are you? I'm not. And it's only become clear to me recently in the past year or so um, as the work has been getting some more exposure, which I'm grateful for. But it, it, it's been clear that apparently people think that it's all all women that I'm painting mm. and drawing and it's very far from the truth what yeah. these bodies are of course is they're incredibly curvaceous and and yeah. definitely soft in certain ways but I also see them as being incredibly masculine as mm. as equally um and I think that there are certain um sort of muscular musculatures that can so easily be ascribed to either gender yeah. but people are never quite willing to accept that okay perfect example yeah. I I don't see why this couldn't be a male body as well as a female body and yeah. I want that to be kind of that's that you know I don't think it has to be clear you don't have to see a penis to just be yeah. sure that it's a, a guy like that's not how we need to kind of be reading yeah bodies it's very it's very basic and and and, and uninteresting it there's a there's a and there's, there's, there's fun that can happen in between there yeah when you think about it. and the, yeah. the strange thing about that is that actually I hadn't at all thought about gender when looking at your work until I saw another interview where you were talking about it and explaining how people tended to ascribe gender. It hadn't even mm. crossed my mind to ask a question about it until I'd seen that. And then it was just kind of so blaringly obvious, of course, like all the figures are, they're not, they're not described a certain gender. Um, yeah, yeah, neither here nor there, a bit of both, um, a yeah. bit of everything, a bit of everything really, um, because of the extensive anatomical sort of training I did as I mentioned I just mm -hmm. I was looking at everything and I'm wanting to put everything in at once and I'm also wanting to remove easy projections that can come from specific audiences looking at you know mm -hmm. black and brown bodies for example yeah. and what we're expected to present as black bodies mm -hmm. and it's it's usually you know genitalia is pretty key and yeah. so 
you know, if this is a black male body, we need to see the penis. Otherwise, it yeah. that's you know, there's a there's a lot mm -hmm. there that I'm not interested in just directly giving into. Um, yeah. And I am interested in the idea of a curvaceous masculine form as well being yeah. like put to the forefront, like exactly with this print, mm -hmm. where it's there's a, there's a lot going on in that sense. And if you really look closely at each form, it won't give you perhaps what you're expecting or or initially thinking about. And I think there's I think there's a richness there. Um, I think that one of your earlier questions that I didn't get to respond to about literature um, and mm -hmm. specifically West African literature, Black American literature, there's a lot of that in there too. And there's a lot of perspective shifts that happen from uh, male to female authors talking about the Black experience. And it becomes very unifying and it becomes very irrelevant about who or what you are as you read or yeah. experience or inhabit this uh, subject point, right? And that's that's a big part of this too um i i kind of want it to be as continually alluring as possible like i'm sure you're familiar with um a quaker a and yes yeah like fresh water that yeah. reading a book like that changed a lot for me you know yeah thinking about having multiple sort of different genders in you at once or something and mm -hmm. then having having it be picked like having a visualization of it too yeah. so it's not just in, in that sense, but in like, a, how would you make a painting of that? How do you create an image of that? How do you really flesh that out in an expressive, colorful way? And I'm like, oh, that's that's incredible. And that's so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's inspiring in a, frankly, yeah, com compositional and color way. It's just like, that's a, that would be a really cool painting to think about, the imagery yeah. that comes from that kind of literature. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm interested in that too, just kind of keeping it as, as open and, and less, easily um immediately understood as possible in that yeah. sense. so keeping it yeah. complex keeping it as complex as it is it is for for us to sort of be in, in in the world and and that also is is on a it's on an everyone's sort of everyone's sense um mm. and when we use the body when i use the body it's there's a there's a certain responsibility whether drawing or painting because there's just so much of the body you know there is just yeah. so much of uh, men painting women specifically or something like that so it's mm -hmm. it's kind of like what am I adding to here and what history am I building on and and what questions am I asking and I'm interested in questioning that the very specific kind of man paints woman history of art yeah. um there was a really amazing moment recently where someone told me that they had found that people were inquiring about my work without knowing about me specifically. And then they thought that perhaps I was actually a woman making these paintings because they weren't expecting a, a, a man to be making these yeah. kinds of paintings or something. And I was like, okay, cool. So I had that in an interview, yeah. I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, people are, they're kind of getting it. It's like, it's not supposed to be just like the easy painting of bodies yes. that, that we're very used to, even though it does come off very sort of simplistic in that sense, it's more just like, I, I just wanted to get people thinking and, and feeling. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And okay, we've reached the, okay, I have one more yeah. question. Just, yes. and then we can take some questions from the audience. Um, Sounds good. But, um, because we've talked about the body so much, um, I don't want to neglect the fact that there is, that there, is um, there are elements of the natural world in your work. Um, and I noticed birds kind of recurring and foliage as well in some paintings, which I'm not sure there were there was much in the ones that we've seen here. But um, mm. yeah, where does nature come in? Um, just to kind of round us off. So the birds and the nature became a, a natural accompaniment to what was becoming a very, it, it was becoming very clear as is with this print that it's mostly just body heavy within the compositional frame. So. Yeah. Although there aren't really, there's not that kind of natural vegetation here in this image. When there are birds or or leaves or kind of, kind of vines or things like that, it's it's me just trying to add a bit of um, external dynamism to the environments that these bodies yeah. are in, um, and also to allow for more compositional, colorful elements to play with more chromatic um, yeah. reactions and and just to play essentially. It ends yeah. up being um, ground for more experimentation and expression um I'm, i am like you know it's a good question because i am trying to balance between that this image for example where it's just the bodies i do also really enjoy this and that there isn't that i don't really see that, that there's a need for else. 
yeah yeah i don't really see there's a need for too much else here but thinking about the practice more expansively yeah it would be um powerful i think for me to also try and offer um a composition like this that was similarly charged but with um more of an environment with fewer figures perhaps or yeah i don't know i'm i'm figuring that bit out still definitely um but but yeah um trying to create the environment trying to charge the environment with the same life that i charge these bodies with i guess is is what is what the, the leaves and the vegetation and the um the birds or other animals there have been other animals that have been involved too you know snakes cranes um mm. a few a few lions actually there's a few lion paintings that i, I thought were fun that kind of thing fantastic thank you so much um Sunji. um i feel like those were really really insightful responses to my very abstract kind of questions um mm. Have we got, how, can we take some of the questions from the... Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tunji. Thanks, Aleo. That was brilliant. So, so inspiring. We've got a few questions. I've got a couple, but anyone at home, just do fire the questions into um, the question chat um, and we'll, we'll get them answered. So, uh, yeah, I've got a few, but I think we'll just go to the audience. So Mona asked, how do you feel the pandemic affected your art? Did, you, did the time allow you to explore your style further or did you feel more stifled? Was there a change in the work from the beginning of the pandemic to the end? Um, so it's a great question. It really afforded me more time and, and space and, and less pressure on myself to do something for a specific outcome. And it allowed me to, to sort of work in more of an experimental state and it also allowed me to be so you know for the for the people watching this and here with our conversation as artists as draftsmen as creatives it's also very historically sound to be working within a pandemic setting or something or to be like you know there's that moment where I was perhaps thinking is this irresponsible of me during this moment to kind of be doing this it's such a privilege to be an artist and to be allowed to express myself in this way but it's so historically documented that in times such as the pandemic are when artists really do the work, you know, in times such as war or anything, like we all know what's happening right now. This, this is, these are the times when we actually should be drawing the most or expressing ourselves the most in that way. And that's sometimes a complicated sort of moral um, thing, but it's really, if you just look back in history, the way it's always been, you know? Um, so yeah, the pandemic was weirdly, you know, I went through some things, there was this big, big family loss moments like that, but um, it was it was good for my work and it was a good moment to connect with what being an artist in, you know, a society in the world that's really kind of tumultuous and constantly shifting can mean and look like and how we're allowed to respond to it and what we can do to just kind of show and, and express ourselves within it and what that then becomes in conversation with and how you then become part of a long line of, of yeah, things, people, expressions, a lineage. So... It was it was a nice connecting moment for me, um, making work in the pandemic. It made me it allowed me to feel um, it got rid of all my imposter syndrome for sure as an artist, um, and I felt quite validated in what I was doing. And um, yeah, and now, and now sort of emerging from the pandemic, and I know you know whether that's happening or not is a bit of a question. But do you feel like your art, your your work is is progressing out of it in an interesting way? Certainly, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to give myself a bit more time and slow things down a bit, but, but yeah, it was very pivotal in that sense. And, um, it, it's been very invigorating in that sense. Um, and given me more license to, again, as I was sort of suggesting, feel more appropriate in responding to what's happening in the world no matter how insane it is with just like drawing a lot or thinking a lot reading a lot especially reading a lot um and again to one of Elio's like brilliant questions thinking about West African literature like uh Chinua Achebe and 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 Wale Shoenka and, and people who have created like the most rich content in the most dire of circumstance <laughs> in a civil yeah. sense right so that's that's a big part of it too and then you see it happening in action in real time and you kind of just feel like you have to get to work or something um yeah 
got a, got a question <clears throat> from Sam Messer, friend of the school. Hi, Sam. Uh, after Blake, you you mentioned some of the literature you find inspiring, and you've just mentioned it there as well, and, and how language might give you clues in your work. So, and I've, I've seen an uh, interview you did about sort of the, the, the sort of American novel and, and the, the titles in American novels um and how that's yeah. influenced your work yeah um thank you sam hi sam sam was a professor of mine at yale um sam introduced me to bob thompson that was that kind of uh he was there for that moment where i was like whoa this is insane i can do this yet it was it was a nice moment um so i'm glad glad that you're here with us um i've had yeah. a strange moment being drawn by sam oh really <laughs> sat drawn, so yeah which is <laughs> That's, that's just not even in the least bit surprising. Sam is everywhere. This is great. That's great news. <laughs> Glad that you're here. Um, um, yeah, the literature. So Chinua Achebe. And then um, also, you know, because I, 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 I studied a lot of a lot of literature in, in high school too, in, 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 or how do we say it, in the UK prep school. Um, and, and that was more um, hardy like Tess of the Durbervilles, like very kind of British literature in this way that I took a lot from as well. Um, and then as I started moving a bit and taking more independent studies, and then I got more into, um, yeah, the sort of like Baldwin, Teju Cole, like West African, Black American mm -hmm. fiction, but like real life fiction, like it's so crazy. It feels like fiction, but it's really just nonfiction writing, um, you know, Chimamanda, um, Akweke, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, and those, those alliterative bodies of work really served as guides because I also saw them as functioning in ways that um, I'm trying to where you have someone who's from a place and is now in a different place and they're writing about their experience of moving through these different places and taking things in and being taken in and how I felt as a non-American black person in America when I first got there and the specifics of that and then you read Chimamanda's Americana and you sort of see a very rich depiction of that linguistically like the most rich linguistic depiction of that and then you hear about Baldwin being black American in Europe and then feeling that and being exposed to West Africans there and seeing a similar kind of self within self or something so reading reading those books has been a really nice um accompaniment to my project and my drawing and my painting and it's like really um satisfying to feel like these thoughts are part of a larger network of of just like experiences or something yeah and yeah we've got another one from alice which says thank you very much for this inspiring conversation i'm curious to know how you start a large painting do you make a small study or do you go into the go into the blank canvas without knowing what the composition will be it's a good question um i really am trying to start doing more of the latter where i go in without knowing, but I tend to start with a small drawing and, and really repeat it over and over and over again. So that by the time I get to the large scale, it's very comfortable and familiar. Um, and it starts with sort of a line drawing. So it really starts quite skeletally in a sense where I've essentially outlined the whole thing and, and then I fill it in and it becomes a bit more suggestive, but it starts with the drawing really. Um, and and that's, that's, yeah, so I start with large paintings. Well, while we're on to the process, I, I, I was wondering about how you, you know, you, we spoke, you talked about music and influences, and I just wonder when you're in the studio, do you have music playing? Is it quite performative? Because your your artworks are so performative to look at. I just want, you know, I've got this imagery of you being quite sort of active and quite sort of, you know, moving around a lot. I mean, I don't want to sort of pry into your artistic practice, but how what's it like in the studio if we were in the studio with you? Yeah, it's it's noisy. It's very noisy, and it's very... Um, because I'm often doing lots of different things at once. I have to keep myself interested and engaged. So I have to move around between things and the music and the rhythm and the pace keeps me, keeps me, um, keeps me engaged. So there's a, you know, a drum beat or a tempo or a pacing that's present in a lot of different kinds of contemporary or like more historical music or, or anything, you know, West African music and South American music both have a similar kind of drum tempo so I can kind of tap into both of those that's also very present in like contemporary hip-hop music rap music like it's there's just a pacing that's everywhere and I try and infuse all of that in initially 
the start of the work when it comes to maybe more because there are moments where I have to turn the music off and kind of be still <laughs> those those are harder um that's that's where it's really challenging where I can't just allow the the music and the rhythm to like carry me through and I have to maybe focus in that's how I would finish the painting so if anyone's curious about how they finish I usually have to turn off the music and just like give each one what it needs and then I can go back to like dancing around and being a bit more free flowing but um yeah closing each chapter requires a bit more silence and um a different level of presence with the with the works but otherwise it's very active and yeah everything happening at once in there I love the idea of, cl of closing a chapter I suppose the last question I think we've just got time for one more and I think you, you, you spoke so sort of inspiringly about the way we use references and the curriculum and the syllabus and Frank Rowling and Francis Bacon and how, mm -hmm. how you know that they should be looked at completely as a par and not a sort of and, and there's Frank Rowling and, and I think you know certainly at the Royal Drawing School we're working hard to sort of make our curriculum more diverse and I know mm. with your um, a Black History of Art Instagram which I, I really advise anyone out there to, to, to check out I just for both of you I just think you know, it'd be lovely to hear more about that and you know how, how you think that's changing and, and what more can happen yeah Alayo how, how about you start with that um the curriculum so mm -hmm. uh, yeah talking about the curriculum and sort of diversifying and how it can change is that what you were asking yes yeah yeah, yeah. so um that's something that I'm really really committed to and I feel like will have the most lasting impact I think often with my Instagram I'm kind of like okay this is great and everything but like I'm not sure how impactful Instagram is going to be in the long run um so yeah I mean I'm always kind of advocating for people to diversify reading lists and for teachers to reference not just sort of the canon and I think I mean even sometimes I begin to doubt myself because of how much I surround myself with um things that are kind of trying to break away from the canon or question the whiteness of art history but realistically thinking back on my experience of school over the past like 10 years school in the UK um yeah there was just no there was a, there was no diversity there were no black artists every time okay. that I found myself referencing a black artist was, it was kind of because I had gone out and looked gone out of my way to look for them which meant that mm -hmm. I would end up with kind of the Basquiat's or the like really really big names kind of from the 80s not mm -hmm. having any idea about artists work in the 90s like Lubaina Hamid mm -hmm. and people like that um and yeah I feel like you know I didn't have the art education that I deserved in that sense so um yeah I don't know um I don't know if that answers your question but that's just well maybe. it's it's to, to to pick up off on that it's I'm coming from a similar similar space where um that was where I was and it's clear that there's been a shift Change. now yeah. ever so slightly and for people in our position like you're you're mine it's we're also somehow involved in that shift so it will be a mm. bit harder for us to see it in real time but it, it is it is happening and through opportunities like this to have conversations like this you know mm. um thank you for inviting us this is like a great moment for that too for us both, both yeah. to like feel like we're doing something for us both to engage because um yeah I met you the first time at my show last year and it's it's great to kind of have a dialogue with you now you know this I feel like we can keep having conversations like this whether uh, like this or in text or something um just now moving forward you know we're now part of each other's journey through this too um and I think that's a big part of it just expanding the network making sure it's getting documented and counted for and um archived the archive is so important <laughs> and um and yeah just just keeping just continuing to work hard yeah Thank you both so much. I think that's uh, that's that's about all we've got time for. But it's been really a really great conversation and, and a really great insight into into your work, uh, Tinji. Um, thank you, thank you both, and everyone listening. If you can make it to the Drawing Years end of year show, which is happening at the on on the eighth of April, opens on the eighth of April, runs through to the fourteenth. It's in Shoreditch in London. It's been it'll be a a great show it is a great show and um do do check that out it's also have an online um online gallery so you can look at it there anyone who's further afield or can't make it uh, and do look out for the next creative conversation which is coming up soon it'll all be on the website tunji adini jones and layu akin kube thank you so much for having for, for coming coming on this call and um giving this creative conversation it's really 
wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you Thanks. and enjoy. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.